Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Andy McDonald, a petrophysicist based in the UK. And on this channel I am aiming to explore various aspects of petrophysics, geoscience and Python. In today's episode, we're going to look at histograms, what are they and how to create them using an excellent Python library called Matplotlib. Histograms are excellent data visualization tools. They allow us to view the distribution of values within a logging curve and they allow us to display a large range of values on a single concise plot. Within petrophysics, we can use histograms to pick key interpretation parameters, such as our minimum and maximum values for our clay volume and shale volume interpretations. To create a histogram, we first take a logging curve and determine the range of values that are contained within it. For example, we may have a gamma ray that ranges from 5 API to 145 API. And with that range, what we do is we divide that up into equal size bins, such as going from 0 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, all the way up to 141 to 150 API. Once the bins have been created, we can then assign the values from the logging curve into each of these bins depending on its actual value. And what we end up with is an interval versus frequency graph like this one here. So let us now jump over to our Jupyter Notebook and see how to create a histogram using Matplotlib. Here we are in our Jupyter Notebook, where we'll go through the process of creating histograms of wild log data. As previously mentioned, histograms are a great way to explore the distribution of the data and are a commonly used tool by petrophysicists for understanding how the data is distributed and also for identifying key interpretation parameters. So the first step in any Python project is usually to import the required libraries. So for this particular tutorial, we will be using pandas, which will be used to store our data, matplotlib, which will be used for visualizing our data, and finally Lasio, which is a library developed specifically for loading and manipulating LAS files. Parts of this library were discussed and covered in my previous video, so check it out if you want to see how to explore the contents of a LAS file using Lasio. So let's run this out. And we can see when it's completed when the asterisk turns into a number. So once our libraries have been imported, we need to import our data. The data we are using for this tutorial, and in fact in the last tutorial, comes from the publicly available Volve dataset. This dataset is from an entire field called the Volve field, located some 200 kilometers west of Stavanger, and was released in 2018 by Equinor, formerly known as Statoil and it was released to promote learning, research and development. It is a great data set to explore and work with, especially for machine learning. You can find a link to it in the description down below. To load our file, we create a variable called LAS, and then read in the file using lasio.read. Within the brackets, we pass in the location of the file as a text string. When we run this cell, we do not immediately see any feedback or value, but a quick way to explore this data is to convert it to a pandas data. For this, we can create a variable called df and then call upon las.df, and this will convert our last file to a pandas data frame. And then we need to take it one step further, and that is using the df.describe method. Once this cell has been run, we can use this pandas function to view a summary of the statistics of our data. And we can see that we have seven logging curves within this file. AC for acoustic compressional slowness, Cali for borehole caliper, DEN for bulk density, GR for gamma ray, NEU for neutron porosity, and RDEP and RMED for deep and medium resistivity. We can also see key statistics for each of these curves, including the mean, minimum, and maximum values. Additionally, we have the percentile values for the data at 25, 50 and 75 percent. Now that our data has been loaded, we can move on to displaying the data as a histogram. If you want to create a histogram with just pandas, you can do so by using the plot function. So in this cell, we call upon the gamma ray or GR column from the data frame by calling the name of the data frame. Uh, df followed by square brackets and within these brackets we can pass the name of the column as a string. Following this we then attach a dot plot function. Now to tell pandas that we want a histogram we pass in what is known as a keyword argument. In this instance we pass in kind is equal to hist. We can optionally call upon plt.show to show the plot. 
However, this is not too important when working with inline plots in Jupyter. So after running this cell, we have our histogram. And along the x-axis, we have the gamma ray values. And along the y-axis, we have the frequency. The data is binned into six different bins in this example. We have five main ones between 0 and 150 API, and also a point or series of points around 250 API. These points are probably outliers and may warrant further investigation to confirm this. We will also cover outlier detection in a later episode. Now that we've seen how to plot using pandas, we can move on to using matplotlib, which is a common plotting library within the Python world. So the syntax changes slightly. First we call upon plt, which we imported at the start, and then in brackets we pass in the gr column from the data frame. We also need to include df before the brackets to, uh, to allow the gamma ray to be passed over. So when we run this cell, we can see that we have generated the same plot as above. So let us begin customizing this plot. The first step is to increase the number of bins so that we can gain a better understanding of the data distribution. To do this, we pass in another keyword argument called bins. In this instance, we will use a value of 30, and this will allow the bins to be narrower. So let us execute this cell, and we can see that we've now got a slightly different plot, but the overall trend is the same with the last one. We can see more variability within the data, and the bins are much narrower. The point at 250 API also appears thinner, which can help us identify this value in the data set, as we have a more accurate idea of the actual value. At the moment, the histogram bars are all merged into one color. We can add some edge color to distinguish the bars, and this is done by adding in the keyword argument for edge color, and we will set this to black. When we run the cell, we can see a much clearer picture of how the data is split. The peak just before 100 API originally looked like a single peak in the previous plot. It is now easily distinguished as multiple bins. At the moment, the chart does look very bare, with no labels. People that view this chart may not know what each axis represents. Also, the x-axis starts offset from the origin. So to fix this, we can add a few more lines of Python code. First, we can add plt.xlabel and plt.ylabel, and these will add labels onto our plot. And we can specify the label name as a text string, and also its font size, which we will set to 14. I have also set x-axis range using plt.xlim to go from 0 to 200. This will exclude the outlier from our visualization. And finally, to change the color, I've added the color argument and an alpha argument. And the alpha argument allows us to control the transparency of the bars. And in this case, I have set it to 50% or 0.5. We can now see that we have a much better looking plot. And we can clearly see what the axis represents. Another useful addition to the histogram is a kernel density estimation. This will add a line onto our plot outlining the variation of the data distribution. To achieve this, we can layer a new plot on top of the existing histogram by adding this line. We change the kind to KDE, and we also assign a color to it, in this case, black. And we can run all of this together, and we generate our plot. We can see it's the same as above, but we also have this black line following the trend of our data. As mentioned earlier, a common use for histograms is identifying and picking key interpretation parameters, such as our shale or clay volume minimum and maximum values. These can be calculated using built-in functions in pandas as seen in this cell. To calculate the mean, we type df, and in square brackets we add the name of the column we want to use, in this case gr. Following that, we can then append the functions of mean or quantile, which is another word for percentile. With the percentile functions, we add in the decimal value for the percentile. So we have 0.05 representing 5% and 0.95 representing 95%. Following that, I have added code, which will output a nice text summary of the values. And each print statement is formatted using F strings. This allows us to easily add variables into the text. When we run the cell, we can see that we have a mean of 71.9 and a 5th and 95th percentile value of 12.7 and 128.3 respectively. 
We can use these values and eyeball them from the previous plot. However, to make it clear for reporting, we can add these lines onto the plot using a method known as AXV line. We can see in the next cell that I've added them here with the same code as before, and with each of these AXV line methods, we can pass in the mean, P5 and P95 that we calculated in the previous cell, and we can also assign colors to them and labels. To make the labels appear on the plot, we can use plt.legend. So if I run this cell, we can now see that we have our key statistics on the plot, and we have also got the legend telling us what each of these key statistics are. And there we have it. We have seen how to create a histogram and annotate it for reporting purposes. You can find a link to the notebook in the description down below. But wait, don't click away just yet. If you've enjoyed this content and want to see more, make sure you click that subscribe button and the notification bell to be notified when new videos are uploaded to this channel. If you want to see how to load last files using an excellent library called Lasio, then click on this video here. Thanks for watching, and until next time, I'll see you later.